Amos chapter 6, media team, I'm going to read just one verse and then I'm going to go down to verse 4. So Amos 6 verse 1, and I'm going to read it King James uh, for a reason. Yeah, that's right, I'm breaking out King James on you. So Amos chapter 6, if you can put it on the screen for me, because uh, NIV up here, yeah, New King James. Woe to you, anytime you see woe, it's, it means warning. You who are at ease in Zion and trust in Mount Samaria... Notable persons in the chief nation to whom the whole house of Israel comes. Now, I want you to look at that for a sec. Go back, go back, go back. Anytime you see Zion and Israel, he's talking about the church. He's not, he's not talking about the heathen. He's not talking about the sinner. He's not talking about the person that's out clubbing. He's talking to the church. Maybe some of you, actually, but to the church. Now, go to verse 4. Who lie on beds of ivory. Anytime you see the word ivory, it means great wealth. Stretch out of your couches, eat lambs from the flock, and cows from the midst, from the midst of the stall. Who sing idly to the sound of string instruments and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David. Who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourselves with the best ointments, but are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Meaning you taught the talk. But you're not walking the wall. Therefore, they shall now go captive as the first of the captives. And those who recline at banquets shall be removed. What is he saying? He's saying those that are complacent will be the first ones to go into bondage. Not those that are sinning. Not the ones that are addicted. Not the ones that mess up. Not the ones that don't know any better. But the ones that are in the house of God. The ones that are in the church but are complacent. Notice verse 1 again. Put it back up there real quick for me. He said, notice the ones that are at ease. In Zion. At ease in Zion. The Bible gives great warning to those who are complacent and are are spiritually falling asleep in church. In in our reading, he says woe, which means warning. He's talking to the church. I thought about Eutychus in the Bible. And I don't have much time to lay a foundation because I want to get into what I'm preaching. But Eutychus, the Bible says he was a young lad and he was in Acts 20. And Paul, the preacher, was preaching all night. You think you got it bad. He was preaching all night, the Bible said. The Bible says he went on and on and on. Sounds like some preachers I grew up under. Went on and on. And the Bible says he began to sink. Nobody goes to sleep over just in a, in a second. They drift. They begin to sink. And therefore, he began to sink. He fell into sleep. And, and he fell out of a window. Because the Bible says he was in a window. Now, if you're inside, if you're in a window, that means you're straddling the window. You got one leg in and one leg out. I want you to see it. It's a type and shadow of a lot of people that come to church. They have church one leg in on Sunday, and then Monday through Saturday they have one leg out, and they're usually the ones that are stopping other people from wanting to go to that church because they invite people to church, but they're not living church Monday through Saturday. And therefore he fell out, he fell asleep, and he drifted, he fell asleep, and therefore he fell out into the ground and died. And it's a type and shadow of the church. When you fall asleep, he was in good preaching. He was in the service. Notice where he was sitting. He was sitting in a window. Now, if you've been to Israel, me and Jeremy went there. The houses had one one door and one window when you first come in. And so the, if you can catch the picture here, Paul would be preaching and the door and the window would be in the back. Notice he wasn't sitting up front. He was drifting to the back. And I believe that's, you know, I'm not, I'm not picking on anybody sitting in the back, by the way. I know we have the front reserved a lot of times. But I'm just talking about it's a type and shadow of you begin to drift. You begin to sink. You begin to sit different places, not sitting in heavenly places. I'm talking about spiritually now. And you begin to drift away from God's word. You drift away from the preaching. You drift away for, you know, you like the music because it makes you feel good. But the preaching, I don't know about that. But he was sitting in a window. He had one leg in, one leg out. And any time you have one leg in and one leg out and you begin to sink spiritually. The Bible says he began to sink. He began to sink into sleep. And when you begin to sink spiritually, eventually you will die spiritually. Eli was a priest in the church. You don't get much more spiritual than being a priest in the church. The Bible says after years of being a priest, he grew heavy. He was, he was overweight. He, he was lazy. He was blind. He lost his vision. He was spiritually deaf. We know that because Samuel could hear the voice of God at a young age, but Eli couldn't hear that same voice. 
Eli wouldn't discipline his kids. He, God told him to take care of his two wicked sons, and he wouldn't do it. His affections, his distractions for other things, he wouldn't pay attention to his family. And before long, he was a priest in the church. But he was overweight, which means he was full of flesh, fleshly things, lazy, blind, spiritually deaf, wasn't taking care of his family. Therefore, he produced two sons that were wicked. The Bible says he had no regard for the Lord. They committed acts with women serving in the church, sexual acts, all because their daddy was complacent in the church. He talked it, but he didn't walk it. And it's possible to be in the house of God, doing God things, doing church things. It's possible to be in church, but the church not be in you. It's possible to be even tithing, even giving, even serving, and just doing the thing, punching the clock, out of obligation, out of relig religiosity, some kind of ritual. My granny did it. My, her granny did it. My mama did it. And now I, we just go to church. Why do you go to church? I, we just go to church. That's what you do. And the reality is you can be doing those things and be dying spiritually, going to sleep spiritually. Revelation chapter 2 he, he's talking to the church of Ephesus. He said, you're doing a lot of things. You're doing a lot of great things. But I have this one thing against you. That verse messes me up, and it should mess every single one of us up. We always hear the gracie, gracie sermons that God is for you, and he is for you. Romans 8, 31, if God be for you, who can be against you? But I just want to say, if God be against you, who can be for you? And he says, you're doing a lot of things, but I have this one thing against you. I mean, you know, we need to probably pay attention. What is it? So we can get it right. He said, you've forsaken your first love. He said, you're doing a lot of things, but you have no relationship and walk with me. How many know physically I can work out? You know, I run just about every day. I, I ran three miles just a few minutes ago before the first service. I ran four and a half the other day. I'm a runner, but I'm not lean. I'm not a stick like most runners are. Because I work this out too. Right? I can do a lot of things, but you're going to know what your diet's like. I don't have to judge you. I'm just telling you. I'm going to know what your diet's like by how you look. It's just reality. And the same is true spiritually. You can be doing a lot of things. You can be going to church. You can be paying your tithes. You can be, I don't drink, I don't cuss, I don't listen to rock and roll, and I don't run with those who do. And you can be doing all the right things, but your diet's jacked up. You have no word. You have no prayer life. Uh, the prayer life you have is at supper time and at church on Sunday. And I just love you enough to come in here and tell you the truth. How I many of those sugar-coated sermons can produce truth decay? So every now and then, you just need a preacher to yank your chain. This is not the Sunday that you looked on, well... I shouldn't say that. Um, how do I say it nice and sweet? This is not the Sunday for life-giving grace. We believe in grace. But every now and then you need a preacher to come in and say, the sinners, we had 220-something that repented in this place. How awkward would it be? Can you imagine the respect and honor we should have for some of you that have come in here? You were sinners. You come into a spiritual place called the church, and you raise your hand, you come to the altar, and you repent. 220-something of them in the past few weeks. That's amazing. I would hate to know a sinner feels more comfortable in here repenting than a church member does. Every now and then, he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Not the sinner, not the wicked, not the heathen. He said, my, my people, my people, every now and then, my people need to understand they need to repent. Notice he said in verse 4, you lie on beds. That's one of the ways that we can detect to see if you have fallen into complacency. You have gotten relaxed. You have gotten comfortable. Messages like this mean nothing to you. In fact, they say the average person in 18 minutes checks their Facebook 50 times. So that means probably you've already checked it about 12 or 13 times. And that book means more to you than this book. It's just reality. 
And, and every now and then we need to hear this kind of word. When the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, the Bible says that they were only 11 days away from the promise. Read it. Deuteronomy chapter 1. They were 11 days away from the promised land, yet they took 40 years to get there. 11 days, but 40 years. They took out kingdoms. They took out nations. They took out armies. They won battles. They defeated this nation. They defeated these giants. The last enemy that they got right before Jericho, right before the promised land. Read this. Deuteronomy chapter 3. It was a place called Bashan. Bashan. It was led by a king named Og. And this king named Og was a giant. Literally, a giant of a man. And you know how sometimes, like David, King David, whenever he was going to fight Goliath, they told tell you how big Goliath's sword was, how, how his you know, armor and all tell that you know this many you know inches and all this. And, and then they, they go to uh, David, they tell you, you know, David is this and that. Uh, but the only thing the Bible says about King Og, it doesn't say anything about his sword, nothing about his artillery, nothing about his mass weapons of destruction. All it says is he, he slept in a big bed. All it says is he had a big bed. And I think it's like almost a, one of those secret words, if you'll dive into God's word. You know, if you read the word, it'll read you. And I think it was a message, a hint to Christians that right before the promised land, right before your greatest reward, You've conquered addictions. You've conquered bondage. You've conquered pornography. You've conquered these lusts and desires and all the sins of the big bad sins. You know, you've, you've conquered all of that. The last thing before God gives you the desires of your heart and you walk into the blessing is you've got to conquer complacency. You've got Satan rolls out a big bed. It's not a sword. It's not, you know, all these carnal weapons, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God for the pulling down the strongholds sometimes the greatest enemy you'll ever have to face is your inner me it's the way we think it's the way we we get back and we get comfortable and say well god has done this god has done that i'm saved i'm sanctified and i'm stuck and I could be that kind of preacher to come in and say, look what God has accomplished in 15 years. Man, we're better than most. 92% of churches, Barna statistics, 92% of churches that start like us, they fail inside six months. Let alone continue to thrive after 15 years. And it'd be very easy just to pitch a tent. It'd be very easy to say, well, we've done that. And lie back on the bed and get comfortable and get complacent and just, you know, be looking for my replacement and looking for Social Security you know, to, to retirement and, and, and buy a house on the lake somewhere and just kick back and say, better than most, we're there. But that is not this kind of church. You do not have this kind of preacher. If you got a pulse, you got a purpose. There is more in you thankful for what God has done but God has got more in you God's got more 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 joy more peace more habit more favor come on more blessings if you don't stop he doesn't stop until you do and King Og had a 13 feet long bed that's a big bed six feet wide The greatest thing you're going to have to face right before breakthrough, right before the promised land, is can, can you fight complacency? Can you overcome status quo Christianity? Can you, can you overcome, watch this, the greatest temptation of Satan, being, being a professional Christian? When's the last time you told somebody about Jesus? When's the last time you hungered for more of him? When's the last time you didn't need anything? You just thought you were fast to draw closer to him. I'm not judging anybody. I'm here to fire some people up. I'm here to, to maybe provoke you a little bit to hunger. and Thirsting for him because he gave you a promise. Those who hunger and thirst for him, he will fill them. Around two years ago, Leanne, my wife, began to, to break out all over her body. And for about two years... We, I say we, really her, she obviously 
went through the agony of it. I think at one time she had 140-something bites waist down alone. And we went to allergist. We went to, to dermatologist. We went to one doctor that had her pretty shaken up. And I guess I didn't get the whole gist of it, but uh, that it could be cancer. There could be some things going on. And this was just before refuel. And we were, we were concerned. We were kind of nervous about it. And, but we couldn't find the answer. Allergists, doctors, dermatologists, nobody had the answer. And two years goes by. And just a few weeks ago, I had my exterminator over just for normal servicing. I think once every two or three months, he comes and services my house. I said, hey, would you mind uh, treating for ticks? I think my wife found a tick in our bathroom. He said, well, show it. Do you have a picture of it? And I said, well, I do. And because my wife don't like ticks in the house. And I don't know what her problem is, but she just don't like them. Um, and so we, we got the picture, and he said, oh, that's what I was afraid of. I said, what do you mean? He said, that's a bed bug. And I said, how sure are you? He said, 100% confident. And he said, did you get a new mattress? Oh. <laughs> Some of you all going to go out and buy a new mattress after this little sermon. I'm just telling you. I said, well, yeah, yeah, we did. And make a long story short, he treated it. He helped us. But I'll, I'll give you the full remedy in a second. But we learned so many nuggets, similarities between a bed bug and how Satan distracts and attacks. You want to hear them? Good, I'm glad you do. I got two minutes and 23 seconds. I ain't ever going to make it. How many really want to hear them? How many really want to hear them? Okay. N number one, pretty easy. Bed bugs are found where people are sleeping. <laughs> That's a revelation right there, isn't it? You came for that. Bed bugs are found where people are sleeping or people are comfortable. Remember, spiritually, Satan likes to work at night. Right? Matthew 13, Jesus is telling the parable of the man that went out and sowed good seed. He sowed out great seed, sowed great seed, but then he went to sleep. And the Bible says while they were sleeping that night, I almost put a sermon together called While You Were Sleeping. Because while they were sleeping in the middle of the night, the enemy came in and sowed bad seed. Samson, of course, we know his downfall happened at night when he was sleeping, when he got comfortable with Delilah, just in a conversation. Bed bugs are found where people are sleeping. Number two, bed bugs are actually attracted to clean environments. Leanne wanted me to make sure I made that good point. She didn't want everybody freaked out because we have, you know, a dirty house. Or No, Leanne's got a clean, we have a clean house, but it's, it's more thankful to Leanne. Bed bugs are actually attracted to clean environments. Did you know Satan is not intimidated by how clean you are? Oh, I'm clean. I've, I would never. I've never cussed. I've never chewed. That's, that is intimidating. The Pharisees were clean. The Pharisees kept the law. Satan's after clean people. You know, when the spirit left the house, Jesus talking in Matthew, uh, he, he casted the spirit out of the house. He went and got seven other spirits and came back and found that house empty and clean. He's attracted to clean places. He's attracted to people that feel like they, they're so churchified and dignified that there's no way they would do anything. And he's attracted to that. You better know who you are. You better know your limitations, and you better know and not forget where God's brought you from. Because some of you I know, and God knows, and you know, and you don't want me to call it out in here now. But you know where you were when he found you. Number three. Bed bugs, some of you are glad I moved on right there. Number three, bed bugs aren't poisonous. Bed bugs actually just make you extremely miserable. And Leanne, I can get a good amen from her because for two years she was so miserable. Let me know Satan wants to make you miserable. He wants to steal your joy. He, he don't mind you in church this morning. He just wants you to be the sulkiest person on the job this week. He wants you to be the one, woes me. Like you swallowed a lemon. Listen, and, and like I said earlier, and usually you invite people to church. People want to go when you're happy. Satan wants to take your happiness. He wants to take your joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. 
He wants you miserable. He don't mind you saved. He just wants to make you make everybody miserable around you. That way you can't take anybody with you. Bed bugs thrive on pressure. Did you know outside of a hotel room? Did you know what the most common place is? Some of you. Oh, you're going to see bed bugs never the same. Did you know that an airplane, the luggage bin over the top, you know, when you go get on an airplane, that's one of the most common places people get bed bugs and catch bed bugs because they're attracted to pressure. Satan loves pressure. He loves to get God's people worn out and attack them with stress and pressure and anxiety and worry and confusion fusion and doubt. And he, 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 doesn't, he doesn't mind, like I said once again, he doesn't mind you in here in church. He wants to stress you out and cause you to worry. And whenever you begin to fall asleep in Zion and you begin to complacency in your wall, then the Bible says be anxious for nothing but in everything with prayer and supplication. But you're not praying and you're not giving thanksgiving and you don't have a walk with him. I'm not talking about all of it. I'm just talking about when we go through those things, the Bible says, do not worry. Do not worry. And he loves worry. He loves pressure. He loves stress. Number five, bed bugs feed on exposed wounds. Now, bed bugs are attracted to your blood in general. Okay? But, but when it's exposed wounds... It's, I don't know if it raises the appetite or what, but he goes for the blood. And the problem was, is Leanne, I'm too gross here, but Leanne would keep scratching, which I don't blame her, but she would keep scratching, and therefore she would keep bleeding. And therefore she would keep getting bit. Bed bugs are, ex- are, are attracted, I sh- feed on exposed wounds. Some of you have wounds from your past. You need to let them scab over and become a scar, and a scar is elevated above the skin. Scars can elevate you. Scars become hard, and you you can become a strong believer and say, look what God has done. I have a scar. But if you don't stop picking at the scab, and that person did me wrong back in 1992, and that person right there, and I'm a victim, and I'm a, you have exposed wounds. And the greatest playground from the enemy is he wants to feed on that exposed wound. Who wounded you? Who hurt you? And he wants to take you out in that way. He keeps picking at it, keeps scratching it and therefore he keeps feeding on it it's good preaching number six bed bugs hide in door hinges it's the truth bed bugs can get into door hinges where the screws are and if you don't look I mean who would ever think who would look for a bed bug in a door hinge right and they and and but we we looked in there and the the point on that is sometimes It ain't God opening that door. Well, but I've been praying for it, preacher. Yeah, that's the mercy of God. Sometimes he loves you so much, he'll give you his permissive will. He'll hand you over. He'll give you what you say you want. That's why I told the teenagers earlier, the greatest thing you can ever have is discernment and know the voice of God. There's a feel for the real. The Bible says there's a way, there's a way, there's a way that seems right unto man, but in the end, it leads to destruction. You better know which way because sometimes he'll open those doors and he'll take you right out of God's house. He'll take your first fruits, your tithe, your money. He'll take all those things distracting you from your family and you don't take all that. Yeah, well, it's just a better job. And it's going to move you away, and it's going to move you away. And you get to, you have to work 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week, and overtime. And I'm going to tell you how we know for sure it's not God. If it takes you out of his house, if it takes your tithe, if it distracts you from your family, it's not God. You've got a bed bug. And that bed bug is working in that door hinge, opening Some doors are meant to open, and God can open them. But if we go and try to open that door ourselves, we don't know the demon on the other side of that door. Bed bugs attack greatest right before dawn. Do you know that? That's the truth. 
bed bugs attack the greatest right before the sun comes up. And, and a lot of times we, we think we've conquered this, we conquered that, we've conquered that, but we haven't got, we, now we're here. Now we're at this comfort zone here. And what you don't know is if you'll fight complacency, there's nothing that intimidates hell more than a fired up Christian. Not some lazy deadhead that you can't get them to praise God. You can't get them to. I'm talking about when a person is fired up, for, but he wants to put this bed because he knows the sun's coming up. Weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. But weeping first, but it lasts for a night. And sometimes the closer you are to your breakthrough, the closer you are to your miracle, you'll get hit right before that with a bed bug called complacency. Just kick back and be comfortable. I'm preaching. I'm almost done. Bed bugs live under the surface. It would be easy if we would have walked in one day because when we first the, the breaking out started. Somebody recommended maybe it's bed bugs. So we looked. Nope, it ain't bed bugs. We looked more than that, but we looked under the, around. But but it would be easy if the bed bugs were out. That's easy. But what it was is there was things under the surface that we didn't know how to look for them, and we brought that mattress. Everybody's going to go home and check your mattress today. You know you are. You know you are. Every single one of you. Won't you just post hashtag bed bugs and just go ahead. And, and, and Leanne was coming out. Me and the exterminator were looking at the back of it. And she said, do I even want to see? I said, nope, you don't want to see it. Go on. Move on. Move on. Because it was where the, but I had to look for the right place. Because Satan is deceiving. Sometimes it may look right. But you're not looking under the surface. You thought you'd forgiven that person, but there's still some hurt under the surface. There's still some pain going on. There's still some junk in the trunk. There's some stuff that can take you out if you don't start looking under the surface. David looked under the surface when he said, search me, O God. See if there's any wicked way in me because I don't want to do anything that's going to jeopardize my walk with you. It is good. Thank you. I wish they were all amen to me like, like, like you want to, Jennifer. I know you're about to shout and run the aisles. but Number nine, bed bugs enter through outside influences. Every one of you, if you want a mattress, go right down the street. Are, are my, my friends here by any chance, by the way, they said they were going to come. because I told them, I said, I'm going to talk about bed bugs and mattresses. It would be a great day for you to come. I need to go work a deal out tomorrow morning. I need to work a deal out so I get a cut because everybody's going to go get a mattress this week. So go right here, and your pastor can eat this week if you'll do that. But bed bugs, this is how we found out we had bed bugs. He said, you get a new mattress. I said, no. And Leanne said, Richie, two years ago. We, I said, oh, that's right. And she said, that's when the, bed, that's when the, the biting started. I'm like, well, wait a second. We got a new mattress. It was wrapped in plastic. Can I just go ahead and give you a word for somebody? If you need a new mattress, you get Robert Haven's pickup truck, and you go and get your mattress. Don't you ever dare let anybody deliver the mattress to you ever again. Because what happens is the professionals, I'm talking about the big buck stores, the main stores, where all of you had your mattresses delivered from. What that happens is they'll come in, they'll bring your mattress, but guess where that mattress was the whole time? It was in the middle of that box truck with all the other mattresses they picked up from other houses. How many just itching right now, me talking about this? I mean, just kind of, I see people. And the reality is bed bugs come into your house because of outside influences. You may be clean. You may have it all together. But who are you hanging with out there? And watch this. Well, they ain't a sinner either. We're not sin. We're not sinners. We go to church. And no, I'm talking about unequally yoked doesn't mean just being a sinner or not sinner. Are they going to this are they going the same direction as you? 
Do they love your God the way you claim to love your God? Do they... How many know you can find good influences at any church and you can find bad influences at any church? I heard somebody say one time, well, that preacher must be this and that because they drink at that church. And I know for a fact that preacher don't drink. But how many of those that the preacher can't control all 5,500, 6,000 people in his church? You've got to make a decision who I'm going to hang out on the box truck with. I'm not going to hang out with people that drink. Why? Because I don't drink. I'm not saying you're going to go to hell. I'm just saying I'm not going to do it. That's why I don't hang out with some of you. I'm, I'm not going to hang out with people smoking. It doesn't mean that people are bad. Are you saying smokers are going to? No, I'd rather have some people. I, I think I'd rather have a church full of smokers that knew, had a great heart and they knew that had some things than a bunch of religious people that thought they were perfect. So I'm not talking about, about I, I, will, I will say, you're, you're going to go to heaven, you'll go quicker than me, but you're going to go to heaven. And I'm going to say it like Jensen said it one time, if God wanted you to smoke, he'd have put a chimney on your head. That's, come on, somebody. Jensen said that, not me, not me. That was Jensen. But bed bugs come through outside influences. I'm going to give you two more. You ready? Media team doesn't have that unless you already put it together. Um, Bed bugs are attracted to the positive. Oh, look at that. You did. I added that one. Bed bugs are attracted because we know this. Leanne is O positive. Why do we know that? Because she checked. How do we know that bed bugs are attracted to O positive blood? Because I was in the same bed with her for two years. This won't fall, will it? And I didn't get it. She got it. I didn't. She has positive blood. That's what the bed bugs are after. Everybody in your life don't need to be positive all the time with you. Sometimes you need some tight but right. Sometimes you need some truth tellers because bed bugs just gravitate to people that tell them, itch, scratch to my ear. I, I wanna, tell me what I need, what I want to hear, not what I need to hear. Tell me this, 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 and it makes you feel good, feel good, feel good. Feel good preaching can take you to hell. If Jeremy comes in and I'm a doctor and says, man, Jeremy has cancer, but man, I want him to leave blessed. I'm not going to tell him. Man, I, you know, after all, man, I want him to feel good. I want to be positive. And he, I send him home to die. How I many know I'm not his friend? I'm only his friend when I don't judge him, but I say, hey, dude, you got some issues. You got some things, and I do too, but I'm just telling you, the Bible says this, and I'm able to talk to him and not only give him the, the he's got a problem, but give him the answer and treat that issue. What am I doing right now? I'm not being negative Nancy or Ned. I'm being positive Paul. Because I'm giving you the problem, but I'm also giving you the answer. It's not negative news. It's good news to those that repent and those who believe and those who are not casual about their walk and casual about their relationship with Jesus Christ. But if you have bed bugs, you just, you just want to tell me what I want to hear. You want to hear fired up preaching on YouTube because that person don't know you. And they can preach anything and you don't take it personal. I know some of you. Yes, I do. Some of you are getting so nervous right now. Two more, two more. Well, I guess one more. Heat is the only thing that will kill a bed bug. Just stay with me. Music worship team, come on, get ready. The heat is the only thing that will kill a bed bug once and for all. Not an exterminator. Did you know that? I didn't know that. We kept calling the exterminator out, wasting our money. <laughs> a heat a exterminator, won't, a, a fly swatter won't do it. A can of bug spray won't do it. Doctors, dermatologists, allergists sure can't do it. 
The only person that could conquer bed bugs in our, in our house was us. The exterminator said, either throw away or throw in the dryer everything that has been. And we couldn't throw our mattress in the dryer, so we threw it away. And, and we threw away the box deals. We threw away. We don't have bed bugs. Amen. If we invite you over for dinner, which probably ain't going to happen because we're busy and you are too. See how I got my way out of that? You are too. You're too busy for us anyway. But the, the point is this. Get back to positive right here. The only thing that can take care of bed bugs once and for all is not a preacher. It's not praying more and fasting more. It's a decision to get on fire for Jesus. He said anything that's been exposed to the bed bugs, any area of this house has been exposed. You either need to throw it away. I mean, we took curtains down. We took, and then he said, your clothes too. I said, huh? I ain't throw my clothes away. I paid too much for my clothes. I ain't throw my clothes away. He said, and you got to throw them all in the dryer. Heat is the only thing that will do it. Stop calling a counselor. Stop calling a preacher. Stop having people pray for you. I'm not saying stop it. I'm just saying until you fix it. Until you get on. Paul told Timothy, I'm reminded of the gift that was in your grandma. It's in your mom. And now it's in you. And I urge you, Timothy, to fan into flame the gift of God that is in you. It's running kind of low. You know what the Bible says in Leviticus? When the, when the fire would run low, the priest, it was the priest. I am your priest today. It was the priest, his role, to go put another log on the fire and get that fire going for the church again. And I'm here to tell somebody that ain't nothing changing until you get closer to the fire, until you start reading. God's word more until you get on fire for him coming early and staying late and praying and fasting all of those things matter I'm going to give you the remedy the greatest disease any Christ follower could ever have we found it in verse 1 of Amos 6 it's called the at ease disease he said those that are at ease in Zion And the cure for the at-ease disease is found in Revelation 2. I want you to turn there with me very quickly, very quickly. Revelation chapter 2, talking to the church. Somebody say church. He's not talking to people clubbing. Unless that's some of you. He's not talking to the rowdy, to to the wild people. He's talking to the church. He said, you've done all these things, yet I hold this thing against you. Verse 4, you've forsaken your first love. Verse 5, he said, remember. Oh, I can preach right here. Remember. You complacent in Zion, just remember what God's done for you. You complacent in your walk, you don't want to sacrifice, just remember the sacrifice he made. You're not sure if you can forgive? Well, let's just think about the height in which you have fallen and how much he's forgiven you of. And that means nothing sometimes to us until we realize, you know, Robert, if I told you you got cancer, you got six weeks to live. Well, let me back up. If I told you, first of all, you don't have cancer. Okay, great, I don't have cancer. But if I backed up and said, Robert, the doctor's diagnosed you six weeks of cancer and then I come in and I say Robert they said you're healed of cancer now it means everything how many saw the video this week the, the forgiveness uh, the, the, the person video and whatever your opinion about it that's, that's irrelevant I'm just saying how many seen it how many seen it do you know I, I'm just sorry forgive me I, I just I guess I've been checked out I've been busy I've just been checked out I didn't even know what was going on and I happened to see the video on Facebook or Instagram I saw the video I clicked on it and I saw who he was saying if you haven't seen it, it's a, it's a great video, but he was forgiven, that, um, the police officer, for shooting his brother, I think. And here's, here's the point. 
I didn't even know what he was forgiving her of because I wasn't, I wasn't checked in. I didn't know. So therefore, it meant nothing to me. I was like, oh, great. He's forgiven her. Like she's like, you know, she stole candy or something. You know what I'm saying? I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know. But then I started looking into it. And I actually Googled. And I'm like, what? And I saw. Like I said, agree or disagree, that's irrelevant. I saw what he was forgiving her of. Now I'm taken back. Wow. He said, remember the height in which you have fallen. That'll fire you up because now you get a revelation of what you've been forgiven of. Now you realize I don't have cancer. Now I realize I don't have to go to hell that I was lost and undone and go into a real devil's hell until he found me and grace picked me up and put my foot on a solid rock and a firm foundation. The blood of Jesus washed me and the, the grace of God, it was so amazing. He saved me. Now, now I got a revelation of forgiveness. Remember, if you remember, then you'll repent. The second thing is repent. Repentance leads the way to revival. And then when you repent, it means, repent doesn't mean I'm sorry. Repent literally means to change one's course. Now I set my affections on things above, not on things on this earth. Are anybody getting anything out of this today? I'm done. I'm done. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. I'm done. But when you renew, you, re, you remember. And then when you start remembering... You begin to repent. God, forgive me. God, wash me, cleanse me. Come on, the sinners can repent. Can the church?